For our next session, I'm going to introduce really two really popular speakers from the Department of Material Science and Engineering, Dr. Wo Chu and my advisor, Dr. Yi Tsui. Both of them are senior fellows at the Precore Institute for Energy. They both have research dedicated to energy storage, and they're the faculty co-directors for StorageX initiative, which expedites the process from academic breakthrough to industrial impact. Uh, I will let the experts speak for themselves, um, with Professor Chu introducing energy, uh, Storage X with more in depth, and then Professor Tsui talks more about our group research. Without further ado, uh, let's all welcome our two speakers for the 40 minute presentation. Great. All right. Well, um, I know you've heard this a thousand times. Uh, let me add my welcome uh, virtually, uh, everyone, to Stanford. Uh, it's a pity that I'm not able to meet you in person. I've always used this opportunity as a way to meet all the incoming um, students to Stanford across um, all seven schools. Um, before I start, maybe I can just ask E also to show his face and say hi as well. E. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Stanford one more time. All right. So as rarely introduced, that E and I are the co-directors of the Storage X initiative uh, in pre-court. And it's our pleasure to tell you about this initiative that we launched in October of 2019 to tackle the challenge of energy storage. I think over the week you've heard about various aspects of energy, and we believe storage is one of the linchpins to total decarbonization, whether it is for transportation, for the electrical grid, or for more advanced applications uh, beyond those. And before I get started, I'd like to just acknowledge, uh, in addition, our managing director, Jimmy Chen, uh, and all of the folks who have contributed to launching this initiative. So I thought I would give a brief history of energy storage at Stanford. So unless you've been living under a rock, uh, you know that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year was awarded uh, to three individuals who have really transformed the way we live. Uh, these were uh, John Goodenough, Stan Wintingham, and Akira Yoshino, who were awarded for their discovery and invention of lithium-ion batteries. And all of you have probably a dozen or more lithium-ion batteries uh, in your possession if you have an electric vehicle, uh, even far more than that. And this is something that has transformed uh, how we use energy, how we use information, and it's going to have very far-reaching consequences going to the future. So our history at Stanford for energy storage, especially on the technology side, really started uh, in the 60s and 70s with our colleague, Bob Huggins. And Bob Huggins was an early pioneer of research of ionic transport. So this is the underlying mechanism to lithium-ion batteries. And he mentored uh, Stan Wintingham uh, as a postdoc uh, who later on to receive the Nobel Prize and also Michel Armand, another key developer of lithium-ion battery technology. So this revolution really happened more than half a century ago right here at Stanford. And I couldn't agree more with the previous speaker that Stanford really is one of their birthplaces of innovation and this is no exception for energy storage. So let me give some perspective on the scale of energy storage. And perhaps the best way to characterize that scale is by the market size. So energy storage is a very broad term. It includes technologies like lithium ion batteries, but also other technologies, for example, pumped hydro, where you would pump water up an elevation and flow it down to store energy. It could also involve thermal storage, uh, and other type of energy storage technologies. If you look just at the battery segment, which is defined as electrochemical energy storage, that segment is going to, it's approximately $50 billion in market today. And in the next 20 years, it will grow to over 1 trillion, which is roughly the size of the semiconductor industry today. And the applications that energy storage touches upon could be, uh, includes transportation, includes consumer electronics, includes electrical grid. So let me highlight a few of those. In terms of the electrical grid, 
what is really important is that as the use of renewables such as solar and wind increase, you have to always worry about the intermittency of those renewable sources. So this is so-called variable generation. You might have already heard about it in the, uh, in the energy at Stanford. To mitigate this intermittency, energy storage is very much needed. And this is one of the major up and coming use of energy storage. In terms of transportation, the revolution in electric vehicle is already happening, has been happening for the past decade. Looking forward, the cost will continue to decrease for electric vehicles because of a cost learning curve in battery technologies, but also as the cost comes down and performance increases, new applications will emerge as well. For example, we already see the emergence of drone technology using batteries, but as they get better, batteries will also enable electric aviation. It would enable freight beyond just passenger transportation. So I think the excitement and the possibilities are really unlimited. And the Storage X initiative is here to really capture the imaginations of all of those working at Stanford and our industrial partners to try to translate some of the fundamental science we do here to real world solutions. So now let me give a slightly deeper overview of energy storage. Like many other disciplines we approach here at the Precor Institute, we embrace the richness in the science and engineering. And this is how we view energy storage. And this is an example for batteries, but you can extend this to almost all forms of energy storage technologies. You really have to think about the chemistries and the materials. You have to think about the devices and most certainly you have to think about the systems. And two ways to think about it is to think about the time scale and the length scale that it encompasses. So if you look at the lower left hand corner, we have the very, the smallest and the fastest process happening at picoseconds and nanometers. So this could be, for example, the movement of lithium atoms in lithium ion batteries. And as you move to the top right, you start increasing in length scale and uh, increasing in time scale, reaching the orders of other microstructure inside batteries to battery devices to battery systems. And here in the battery area, we're really combining all aspects, synthesis, manufacturing, characterization, modeling, data analysis, to really attack all the underlying science and engineering problems. And one of the great thing we have at Stanford is the people. We have now formed a team of more than 20 faculty members and nearly 200 graduate students and postdocs to tackle this wide ranging time and length scale when it comes to energy storage. We have colleagues working on chemistry. We have colleagues working on structure and device design. We have colleagues work on systems and economic analysis to really try to span all the skills I've discussed here. And we have colleagues contributing from uh, four out of the seven schools at Stanford. So this is really a team effort to pull this together to tackle this challenge of energy storage. I wanna take a moment to appreciate our industrial partners. So this initiative creates a co-innovation ecosystem. And by co-innovation, we mean that to integrate the innovators here at Stanford and the innovators in industry, who many of them are charged with the task of scaling up the solution to the terawatt hour and to the trillion dollar scale. And these are the companies we are working with. They go all the way from materials and, and raw materials and chemistry to devices, to energy systems. And we're now in the process of adding additional partners to have a comprehensive coverage both horizontally and vertically within the marketplace to really attack the problem from all ends. So let me take a moment to discuss what we think to be the top research priorities for the initiative. Uh, let me note that this is just the starting point. We are in the process of expanding and refining, but I think this will give you a flavor of the top challenges that we think the community at Stanford uh, and elsewhere face. Probably the most important 
priority for us is to develop energy storage technologies that's disruptive and also satisfy different requirements depending on the use cases. And this is really embracing the X in storage X. We are now looking at energy storage technologies of all forms, not just batteries, and embracing this diversity of technology and subscribing to the view that there's no silver bullet, no single silver bullet is one of our key um, ideas. With regards to energy storage technologies, cost is one of the dominant issues. And as you have seen in lithium ion batteries, the cost learning curve has been steep. Sustaining it is going to be an incredible challenge. So we are keeping very much in mind the cost of the technology, the cost of deployment, the cost of scaling. Third, we are continuing to identify pathways to improve batteries. And what we really want is a battery technology that can give you high energy density, high power, safety, and long lifetime, all of them together. It's difficult to have all four at the same time. And this is something that continues to motivate us. Number four, as I mentioned, to scale up to the terawatt hour to the trillion dollar scale, we really have to think about manufacturing. And you have heard a lot of Kika factories, for example, in the popular press, and a lot of the underlying problem are very scientific in origin. So we're continuing to invest time and effort to think about how basic science could help to speed up the scaling up process. Number five, as the battery market continued to explode, a circular economy is very much needed. And this is discussing the reuse, recycling, and the regeneration of batteries, and then to also understand the cradle to grave environmental impact for deploying technologies like batteries. One really good example is the lead acid batteries. Uh, lead acid batteries has a recycle rate of uh, 95%, and this is why we get to use lead, which is a toxic element, in a sustainable fashion. So something like this has not been realized, for example, for lithium ion batteries. And this is something I think that's going to have far-reaching societal impact in the next one or two decades. And then finally, it took us about 40 years to get to where we are with lithium ion batteries. And I do not believe we have 40 more years to do this. So we are now very much concentrated on speeding up and accelerating the pace of research and development. We are leveraging informatics and artificial intelligence to think how we can develop these technologies in a much shorter time frame, which is required by all the climate challenges we have. So these six research priorities hopefully give you a sense of what we are after and our faculty colleagues, students, and postdocs. And we hope so hope you to participate in some aspects of this during your time at Stanford. So let me say a few more things and hand it off to E. One of the pillars of storage decks is to connect fundamentals to translation. On the left, I'm showing you some of the key characteristics of academic research. These include fundamental understanding, materials design, big science facility. You heard from uh, Professor Chi Cheng Gao, who is the director of Slack and our ability to embrace new directions very quickly. On the other hand, we have industrial R&D on the right. And there, the core competence include prototyping, scaling up, optimization, integration, cost, life cycle, business models. And our goal is to empower our students, postdocs, staff, and faculty to combine the best of both worlds in a pre-competitive setting with the singular goal of de-risking the commercialization of technology, meaning to deliver the solution at a very large scale. This slide is a little busy, but it lists a couple of the major projects we're working on. Uh, you can read them. It gives you a sense of the breadth of the initiative. It really covers everything from technologies to policies to decision-making and other aspects of energy storage. Let me very quickly highlight two themes that we're working on. And these two things I'm highlighting really capture, I think, the integration of storage X. One 
theme is extreme fast charging. So extreme fast charging refers to developing the technologies and the infrastructure needed to charge batteries quickly. And this has very significant impact, not only on passenger transportation, but also on freight and aviation. And to give you a sense, to charge a battery in five minutes, for example, an electric vehicle, will take about 1.2 megawatt of power. And this is equivalent to about 1% of a Boeing 737 taking off. So this describes the challenge of the problem. Another way to view the problem is just simply look at the electricity demand, and this was highlighted by the previous speaker. If you think about having 5 million electric vehicles in California in 10 years, this is going to translate to about 50,000 fast chargers. And we're talking about just today's fast charger, not the five minute charger. This is um, your sort of 90 minute charger. This is going to require about 25 gigawatt of coincident peak power. And this means we have to increase the power capacity in California by two times. So this gives you a sense of the, how enormous this challenge is. And here at StorageX, we are really trying to approach this from a holistic manner. This flow chart here describes how energy would flow from the electrical grid all the way to the battery. We have to think about the charging station, managing the grid, um, high power electronics, high conductivity cabling. We have to think about the vehicle which controls the charging. And this could be thinking about how to deliver the electrons in a efficient manner, and this will leverage data analytics. We have to think about engineering of the battery packs for managing heat, for sensing failures in the battery. We have to think about the battery cell in terms of the microstructure, the chemistry. Uh, and we also have to think about the underlying materials to achieve sufficient kinetics, for example, to be able to move lithium back quickly. So this is one problem we're tackling, and it requires integrations of many expertise. The second theme I want to show you briefly is the circular economy. Again, to give you a sense of how enormous this problem is, by 2030, the most conservative estimates indicate we will have about one terawatt hour of second light batteries. So these are batteries that are coming off their first use cases, for example, EVs. And this will result in a tens of billion dollar market, not to mention the embodied CO2 uh, from the manufacturing of the battery. So really what we're thinking about here is how do we make decisions after the battery comes off their first use? Do we recycle it by taking the material and reducing down to the key, the initial ingredients? Do we reuse it in a second life application or third life application? Do we regenerate it? So a lot of these decision making rely on the economics and the valuation. So we're in the process of building a valuation model so we can make these decisions. And it requires input from many things. For example, we're using data science to predict how batteries would behave in their second life uh, use cases. We are thinking about the system engineering. So how do we design the battery pack so they're easily reused or regenerated or recombined from one application to another. And thinking about the actual practice of recycling, how to lower the cost and the carbon footprint, and also think about chemistry strategies to take a battery that has been spent and then regenerating it. So with this, let me stop here and hand it over to Eve, who now will give you um, a highlight of some of the research in his groups on how nanomaterials have really transformed uh, battery technologies over the past 15 years. E? Okay, thank you, Will, for the introduction. As you can see, everybody is really, really exciting to work on uh, um, energy storage. Let me play, okay. Um, <clears throat> well, you have seen um, the very rich history, Stanford right here, to work on batteries. Now expand much further on energy storage. It's, it's, we call storage X. X equals to batteries plus many, many other things. 
So I want to share with you some perspective after I joined in faculty about 15 years ago. Um, to, I would say we start the battery program right here at Stanford. So uh, I'll call it Bob Hawkins has retired for many years. I remember coming in and I didn't even know he was at Stanford. Uh, uh, I didn't work on batteries before. Um, so after coming here, it appeared to be already very exciting. Uh, it's necessary to have energy storage solution for the car, for the electric grid. Uh, I want to share with you some of the examples in, in my lab. Uh, Will has nicely, you know, given out his time. Uh, initially, we were thinking about also having him to share his group example as well. He has uh, uh, many, many uh, exciting projects in his group uh, you could learn about. Um, coming back to this reinventing the batteries, right? you see lithium ion batteries uh, getting the Nobel Prize last year, but the invention really started about 50 years, 40 years ago. It's indeed uh, the history of lithium ion battery just as old as me. Uh, I look at that. Then uh, our, our alumni Stan Whittingham and published the science paper that was in 1976. By the way, that was the year I was born. So I oftentimes make joke I was born for the lithium. So, um, so in real metal batteries, try to answer this question. Well, how high energy density can batteries go? Wow per kilo, wow per liter, per weight or per volume. Can we double or triple of that? This huge meaning right there. Battery life much longer. Will mentioned in his uh, previous uh, slide, right? We want very long battery life, 30 years, 10,000 cycles or more. How fast can we charge? Less than 10 minutes, can we get to five, right? Five minutes, you are going to have Boeing 787's 1% taking off power. That's a lot of power. Can we make the batteries completely safe? Reduce the cost three to five times. Reuse and recycle, grid scale and seasonal storage. All these questions has huge research opportunity, looting back to science and engineering. Um, 15 years, I set up research program. Stanford is just an amazing place. You know, I have, I have no bad experience before coming to Stanford. I work on nanomaterials, working on electronics, looking, working on nanowire, quantum dots, and so on. I come to Stanford. Uh, that was the time we have Global Climate Energy Project. That's the, uh, the organization gave me the first uh, funding grant. Let me really start a battery program at Stanford. So over the years, we tried to address these challenges uh, I mentioned in previous slides. But let me just highlight a few within short amount of the time. One is how do we do high energy density batteries? Uh, if you look at the Nobel Prize winning work, that's uh, in the lab right here, right? That's the um, lithium ion phosphate, lithium cobalt oxide, and lithium uh, graphite, you know, that's the end note. So vertical acids is the amount of uh, volume expansion. Once you put lithium in and take lithium out, horizontal acids is the lithium store in the host materials. Uh, what's the atomic ratio of lithium number versus the material you store lithium? The lab, about one to six, you know, six host atoms, only one lithium. You spend a lot of atoms store one lithium. That was the uh, you know, previous 40 years. Then you ask the question to increase the energy density. I want a lot more. How do I get it? And uh, you need to have these new materials coming in, store more and more lithium, this ratio goes up and the relative volume change will go up. So if you can make the new materials to work, you know, this is the roadmap uh, I personally really like. I think this is also the roadmap many people will agree. Is we are now in the bottom right here, close to about 300 watt per kilogram using graphite and lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. Uh, can we go higher using silicon anode, using metallic lithium anode, and then change the uh, cathode as well on the top is lithium metal and sulfur. This allow you to have a roadmap possibility of double or might be even getting close to triple of the energy density down the road if you know how to make these materials to work. So, and over the years using silicon as an example, in 2008 we published this paper of uh, and using silicon nanowire to solve the big problem of the volume expansion I showed you in previous slide, new materials. You want to reinvent the battery using new materials. They have big volume expansion, structural change, mechanical breaking, 
So 2008, we published this paper using the nanoscience approach to solve the volume expansion breaking problem and make it more stable. Um, so it's, it's fun, just the journey really started then. Um, and over the past 15 years now, we have 12 generations of material design. I won't go into the details. And each these design is try to solve breaking problem, instability of the interface between your materials and the electrolyte, uh, reduce the surface area, making it low cost and, and, and so on. It's a really, really good uh, learning process for us. This is also through this research indeed, you know, for me coming out of a different field and now opening up a new field of nanoscience design for the batteries. So that now is growing uh, into really, really big. Uh, then what's the holy grail right there to have high energy density is really the lithium metal, metallic lithium anode. You know, graphite moving into silicon, you increase the energy density. If you can use metallic lithium anode, that would be great. 50 years ago, when people started lithium-based research, it's trying to use lithium metal, metallic lithium. But during the plating, you know, this layer, plating building it up, and when you do battery charging, you're going to strip away this lithium. This plating is stripping mechanism. We really don't know how to handle, because you need a few hundred, 500 cycle, 1,000 cycle or more, eventually 10,000 cycles. This process create a lot of problem grow, growing up the energetic lithium, cause the dead lithium formation. We don't know how to handle that. So at Stanford right here, we have a team of people. I work closely with uh, Steve Chu, with Jenan Bao, and try to, we actually invent a new approach. How do we design a stable host materials, put lithium in, store metallic lithium right there, just like graphite store lithium iron. Now we have an approach to store metallic lithium into nanoscale domain, make it more stable. We also learn how to build stable interface using new type of polymer coating, cell healing, and, uh, and, and many inventions uh, really happened in the past roughly seven, eight years. So it's been a really exciting area. And uh, Will, Will does, didn't have a chance to show you his own data. He has this mapping or plating and stripping of uh, using atomic force microscopy microscopy to, to really monitor the nucleation process. That, that's just been fantastic. So we now have a really a center of expertise and it's really a center of excellence right here of tackling this uh, grand challenge, this uh, holy grail of uh, battery research. So I want to mention also battery charging as, as well. It's a full of exciting opportunity. We'll mention to you, you know, battery fast charging is a system level think thinking from the grid, from the uh, pack to cell to materials. Let me highlight inside the cell, right? What you need to consider is mass transport, how fast you can move lithium ion or other ion with its other type of batteries. How do you let the charge transfer across the interface, right? Going into the material, crossing the liquid and solid interface right there. And then this temperature and homogeneity, this is a cell inside it's hotter because dissipating heat to outside, you know, will be slower compared to the outer part of the, this battery cell. And the thermal issue will induce many complications. So this is an area multidisciplinary research is needed. People working on chemistry, materials, thermal and the mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and the you know electronic design and the grid level and, and all need to come together to ca tackle this problem. Well let me also emphasize in university we need to have really powerful tools right here and we have Slack just you know and really on Stanford land you have learned about Slack having this powerful x-ray tool uh, Wheelchair use that tool a lot and, uh, and really, uh, 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 you know, having uh, many uh, major discoveries and understand the batteries, how it really work. And here I want to emphasize another tool, another set of the tool. Stanford is trying to building up even more right now. One is this in situ electron transmission electron microscopy. You can build a battery cell inside transmission electron microscopy. For example, this is a silicon nanoparticle. You put lithium in during charging, you can see this particle volume expansion is taking place. Eventually, the stress stream buildup is too big, this particle will be broken. Uh, 
And uh, this type of tool really allow us to study how battery fail, uh, understand chemomechanical coupling in this process. Another tool we use uh, uh, quite a bit is this, uh, this is in situ SEM, nano indentation. You have a mechanical indenter and then onto this many this uh, aggregation of nanoparticle forming secondary particle. You can measure the force and displacement. And then you see how this particle get broken under what force and really study this mechanical behavior and in real time and really figuring out what's the guide, guiding principle to design the material that can take on mechanical pressure. And another approach right here inside TEM, we have this environmental TEM Titan, right? This is lithium metal used exposed to wet nitrogen, a little bit of moisture, just go react with lithium metal like crazy and really help us to understand why this battery material is so sensitive to water. So I also want to highlight one more new technique is cryogenic electron microscopy. In 2017, you have learned about a Nobel Prize was given to the cryo EM to solve the protein crystal structure, right? For bio structural biologists get, getting the Nobel Prize. In 2017, we also published this paper for the first time using cryo EM to study the battery materials. The reason to use that is battery materials are fragile under the beam, oftentimes they are not stable. You know, before this paper, there has never been a high resolution, atomic scale resolution of lithium metal image. So in my lab right here, we developed this tool. How do you freeze your sample into liquid nitrogen that's very cold and stabilize that, doing a cryo transfer and put it into the TM grid and make it more stable. And we were able to resolve atomic scale resolution of lithium metal for the first time. This type of tool will open up huge opportunity to look into the battery interface, so-called solid electron interface, that's SEI, look at many fragile materials, important energy materials, metal organic framework, perovskite solar cells, electro catalysts. Now this is really an explosion stage. Actually, tomorrow is the time a National Science Foundation will start a, a really a TEM workshop to discuss, uh, you know, what TEM tool should be developed to impact energy, quantum materials. Uh, so I will end my presentation by sharing with you, resonate with earlier speaker. Stanford is a place combining cutting edge research and uh, entrepreneurship really well. In my 15 years here, you know, when I look back, when I joined in fact, I know nothing about starting up company, but this environment is really nurturing me to think about how do I take the materials that knowledge in, from academia lab into industry. I found the in 2008, Amplius using the silicon nanowire, silicon nanotechnology generating the highest energy density batteries now in the world. It's in, in, in a major discussion with uh, many application companies to use that. For example, Amplius battery enable Airbus commercial drone flying for 25 days without stopping and uh, 70,000 feet. Uh, 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 energy density needs to be very high. And a few days ago, we just announced uh, spinning out a new company for large scale energy storage called Enervanil and taking out nickel hydrogen, metal hydrogen gas batteries and, uh, and now having extremely long cycle life, 30,000 cycle, you know, 30 years lifetime, low cost to impact risk scale storage. This is a new type of textile I work on. Also, we now put into the uh, uh, commercial space. I want to share with you, I have a clear clothing right here. This is the warmest clothing ever invented in the world. It's only 0.3 millimeter thick, but this allows you to go to a temperature 10 degrees Celsius and you feel very warm. Uh, and to fight with COVID-19, you know, we have this nanofiber technology and made the best uh, mask uh, with a great breathability, even though this is not related to energy story, I want to share with you. This step is the place to do invention and then even in, in commercialization. This is the mass from a 4C air and uh, having the uh, amazing breathability because of nanofiber is in there. And there's many other things. So I'll stop right here. Uh, and coming back to energy storage again, that's the topic of discussion today. Will and I will be happy to take any questions you have.
talk. Um, I was curious, both of you focused a lot on large-scale energy storage. I was curious, what was your opinion or initiatives in the StorageX uh, program on kind of the opposite end, on Internet of Things, on kind of millimeter cubes, scale batteries? Um, what technologies do you think we'll need to, um, I guess, develop in order to achieve kind of wide scale implementation? Uh, maybe I'll take it first. I, I think at this moment, Optimus is very wide open. There's not a, a single technology yet. For large scale storage, it ranges from time scale from minutes to hours to day to weeks and then to seasonal. And each this time scale, the requirement of the cost is very different. Uh, for example, lithium ion could be, uh, might be able to handle right, uh, day to day uh, quite well, hours to hours, but seasonal will be too high cost. Uh, so that's why it's very wide open. And it could be the battery storage. It could also be thermal storage, for example, and other means of storage if people come up, the, the right technology with the right cost, the right lifetime, it, it could fit. So grid scale storage because of this uh, very different time scale and it can accommodate many different technologies in this space. Well, I don't know whether you want to add in something. Yeah, um, I think this is a great question. And to add on what you already said, um, so for IoT, the requirements are very different. So for example, um, it has to be small, so you're naturally maybe thinking some sort of a thin film battery that you can maybe build on the thickness of just a fraction of a credit card. Um, you know, one application of it is integration onto a credit card. So I think it will look very different than today's battery. The prominent technology being considered for IoT is solid state battery, which means no liquid, all thin film built, CMOS compatible. Um, so this is going to be a very interesting area. It also builds upon the, um, some of the advancement needed for electric vehicle. Uh, flammability of the liquid electrolyte is a huge problem. So it's actually coming together in very interesting ways. Um, in terms of the requirements, IoT batteries have to have very low self-discharge rate, which means that you don't want it to lose energy unnecessarily. And that's very different than electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, if you lose your charge over a month, that's totally fine. But for IoT, you might want it to stay around for uh, a year. So it does call for a different set of technologies to do that. Very interesting. Thank you. Is that also um, one of the programs being pursued by the StorageX initiative or by professors at Stanford? So I don't know about others, but certainly E and I are working very actively on solid state battery. There are a few theoretical efforts on solid state batteries as well. Um, I'm not actually sure if anybody's building. Sorry, it's my son. Um, so um, we are developing the materials for solid state battery. I'm actually not aware of anyone building a battery for IoT. That will be a very exciting directions, I think maybe in collaboration with our EE colleagues. So I, IoT area is very diverse. Uh, it's very, very diverse. Probably need to go into what's the detail IoT why right, people are looking into. Then you find in many IoT area, lithium ion could already be sufficient. But once you go to the IoT, the footprint is so small. We, we'll mention, you know, go to thin film, solid state that's needed. Uh, so this probably require longer conversation. And uh, in double E, and uh, a few years ago, I was uh, interacting with our double E colleagues, right? They were thinking a bit about building one type of IoT is you can build a scanning electron microscope and in your pocket. I can see that that's one type of IoT. And then you need to have really tiny battery or, or thin film as an example. 